Hello and welcome to the Photo Brigade podcast. I'm Robert Kaplan. Today I have Peter Hurley for a second appearance on my podcast. How are you doing, Peter? Number two. I'm doing good. Number two, but we're uh, celebrating podcast number 100. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. I oh mean, my gosh. Congratulations. Thank you very That's much. Amazing. We've had a pretty amazing day. Normally I, I do one podcast at a time. This time we're doing three. We had my friend Mike Eisler. We had just had Nigel Perry on, who's you know an unbelievable photographer, and I'm sure inspires us all. Uh, I know that you had a little story that maybe we'll talk about beyond that. But before sure. before we start, I just want to say thank you to Adorama, their event space, for allowing us to host podcasts and events here. Um, please subscribe to our YouTube page, Photo Brigade on YouTube. Uh, we're, this is where we post all of this content. You can always go to photobrigade.com slash live to see all of this, uh, you know, material that we're producing. We're also coming out with a new show soon. So all sorts of really cool stuff happening. And I hope that you keep uh, stay tuned. Uh, thanks to Canon Professional Services. Thumbs up, Canon, right? Major yeah. thumbs up. And uh, thanks to Temba Bags and, and to Photo Shelter and, and everybody else who uh, helps support Photo Brigade and our industry. Um, but uh, let's get to you, Peter. Uh, you just just jumped off a plane and came straight here. Yeah. That's awesome. And you, you know what the funny thing was? The guy who picked me up in the lift was a photographer, a portrait photographer. Really? It just, <laughs> yeah. just so happened. I get in and the guy's a photographer. So we just live streamed the whole ride back over here. So that's that's <laughs> one of the, the things that I want to talk to you about. Let's So briefly, I'm going to go over briefly what it is that you do. You are a headshot portrait photographer um, and uh, you work here in New York and, and you are like known for being the the headshot guy like that's like you've built your brand around it i did and um beyond that you also have a network of photographers called the the headshot crew let's see here the headshot crew you got that one up there too i'm sure i do somewhere where we've got over ten thousand photographers on the crew now peter hurley's this is it there, the, yeah yeah go up to the top let's see oh that's not no that's you're not on the actual site. go down to the bottom there it is there it is headshot crew yeah there it is so so you have a bunch of feature uh headshot photographers that that kind of work in the same capacity that you do they send you their their work and you kind of license them not well, license these, them but these uh, photographers that are on the site are associate photographers of mine so they have to go through a process to get there and then they're approved and they become that. If you search this this photographer search, if you're not on the network, just sign up because people can come here to Headshot Crew looking for a headshot, put in any city, and you could potentially come up there. Obviously, the associates come in at the top, and then and then it goes down from there. Like, that's New York, and you could see some of the people that are involved. And you could see the little marks on the map. Like, we've got the whole world covered, which is great for me because I'm getting calls from companies now that say, hey, we I got a call uh, about a week ago. We've got 875 employees in 56 offices, and we need them shot all over the world. And I was like, oh, I can do that. I mean, I'm not gonna have to do it personally. I have photographers in every every city now, mm -hmm. so um, it's been amazing building the network and having it built up to, into what it is today. I'm gonna show some of your work here. Some of this is more of your portrait. You got a lot of some of the celebrity work that you've done. Um, some so this uh, like, what did you shoot uh, her for? It was a cover of a magazine called The Wrap. So so you you don't don't just do headshots. You do portrait shoots for for magazines and whatnot as well yeah i do everything that comes down the pike um and mostly people walk in my door every day for a headshot but sometimes you know i'll get the calls and i, I never had an agent um i've always just gotten these jobs randomly through different clientele that knew my work um, and every day I'm doing, I'm usually doing headshots. If I'm not, I'm not, I'm trying to do something else, obviously. Right. Right. So, so these, these are the uh, portraits you've also done. You went, you were on the set and a lot of, I should also mention, this is our second podcast. So we're really briefly going through what, you know, what you do because we really covered all of that yeah, on a previous for, podcast. Yeah. I, what I want to talk to you about more in this podcast is business and what you've been doing sort of since then. Um, so, sure. so as I briefly go through, here's a, a shoot that you ended up doing for lost the, yeah. the TV show lost where you went and photographed, um, you know, the people on set actors, not just the actors, this was but also an exhibition, um, that was at the Vilcek foundation in New York. So I did this shoot, um, I was so upset because that year, two of my biggest jobs fell within the same week. So I had to leave 
Hawaii to uh-huh. come back to New York for another shoot right. with a guy who was an author who was amazing, so it was really worth it. But but um, this was an incredible job. It was just so much fun. And it was for the Vilcek Foundation, who celebrates uh, immigrants that have done great things in, in this country, um, either have immigrated here or first generation and so all these people's either parents had immigrated or whether they were actors or behind the scenes or whatever they were doing on the set that's what this was about it was really cool and then to get oh i guess i need to reload this page for some reason um but uh, this is this is sort of you have the sort of special peter hurley headshot style which which is you know your, your sort of namesake which is you know white background but with what what would that style be can you explain what do you I, even know? My, my, it was just like really clean. I, I I was I was an actor, and I was the model actor bartender dude. And um, fortunately, I I hung out with Bruce Weber a bunch, and he had shot me for a bunch of stuff. He said, "Pick up a camera, pick up a camera, pick up a camera." And I had looked at all these actors' headshots, and I went to this photographer who shot on a white background to take mine, and I really I liked it. It was black and white. It was nice. You know, I had always been drawn to to Nigel's work too. Um, and that's why I asked the cropping the head uh, <laughs> thing because I get that all the time. Um, a funny story I want to tell. I'm, I'm self-taught, uh, and I started shooting with my butt on a windowsill of a, in a building that faced south, and that building faced a building uh, called the Stare at Lehigh building, and in the building there were always all these strobes going off. It's that huge building that takes up the whole block on 26th Street. So one day a friend calls me and says, I had never had a studio. Friend calls me and says, uh, hey, I got a studio. And I was wondering, I've got a little office off to the side. Do you, do you want to come take a look at it? I need to rent it. And I was like, well, sure, I'll come take a look. It was in that building. Hmm. So I go into this studio, but she, the office off to the side didn't have any windows. I was a natural light shooter. Mm-hmm. I was like, what am I going to do? This is going to be a disaster area. But I was like, you know what? I'm gonna, I got to make it work because my dream was to be in that building. Well, in that studio, it was called Pure Space. All these major shooters every day used to come in and rent it. And one guy, one day, this guy named Nigel Perry was in there. And... Uh, <laughs> So I'm off to the side, and I'm and and by this time I was doing a. This was about 2004. I was doing a. I I did a, what I used to do is I used to. I the way I taught myself is that I used to like peek around the corner and try and look in and see what people were doing. I couldn't really go in there. The studio manager would be walking around, and I was being like, "What are they doing? Where's the light? What kind of lights are they using? What modifier? What's going on in there?" And but they they were like, "You can't. Don't be like this curious kid that goes in there and bugs anybody." So I couldn't do that. But some days the the shoot lasted a couple days. I think in in Nigel's case it was just one day. But um, there was another ph- photographer, Perry Ogden, who came in, and he st- set up these continuous lights and he and he did this Kino Flow setup. And I was like, oh my gosh! So that was there. And then he left and he left the lights. And the next day I went in and I set up the lights and I started shooting a Kino Flow mixed strobe setup and I've been doing it ever since till I designed my flex kit with Wex Scott. Now I have LEDs that I do that with. But on Nigel's way out, he stopped in, and he said, there, in this room I was in, the flash would always go off, and people were always curious, what's going on in there? And he stopped in, and I got to say hi to him. And after he did that, I went and bought Blunt, and it, there's four books that sit in my studio on my shelf, and it's one of them. That's awesome. Great story. So. Well, <laughs> thank you, Nigel, for for being part of the podcast and inspiring us all. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things that you talked about at – was your your flex kit what is the site for that i, I had it up but i had to switch browsers Curly here progear.com com. okay so so i want to talk about business more with you this time around uh you have so this is what it looks like uh for a one of your portrait subjects looking back at you pretty much i do it as a square it was just based off that window i used to sit my butt on the window so i shoot people in front of me so i was like all right what do i do with these lights and i was like i'm going to set them up like a window and shoot through it and that was the basic gist of it so i started shooting like that for years and then i started to modify for guys i do a modified setup of that where i like to you know add some shadowing and for 
women sometimes i'll do a triangular setup gotcha gotcha so you so you've actually gone in are you man you're working with westcott to do this is that what yeah. you said okay yeah so you're working with a manufacturer it's not like yeah. you're manufacturing your own stuff no westcott had this little panel design this 10 by 10 called the flex uh-huh. and they came to me with the idea and showed me what do you think of this and i was like oh my gosh can we just make it longer and a little wider and uh, we did, and we came up with this this flex kit, and uh, it's been selling really well, and people love it. The light out of it's amazing, and for me, it's uh, it's twofold. I use it to shoot my subjects, but now, you know, the way it is, we need uh, to have behind the scenes videos all the time. Now I have light for not only lighting my subject, I also have light for shooting my videos and stuff like that. So oh yeah, very I nice. I use it for both. So when you say shooting your videos, you're talking about the videos that you're providing for your community or are you talking well, about video you're getting into video work yourself i no 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 i don't do video work for instance videos i provide for my community actually right. dave does all my videos yeah dave we got Geffen's dave Geffen here, back so here dave i'm working all with him videos, as well so, yeah. um and so what's the, the web address first of all wait a second you got the another all these bits of business you've just put out a book yes uh called uh, the headshot yeah and how's that been going it's what? been amazing well the they told me that most books they do like one run and then if you're lucky, you get a second run. This book launched in August of 2015, and they're already into their third run. So it's selling like crazy. I've actually got a deal right now where you can get it for free if you sign up for the Headshot Crew. So if you go to headshotcrew.com and sign up, if you go to register, go to register go here. There, and you can get my coaching and you the monthly subscription with the free book. You pay for two months, you get the book free. So the book's 45 buck 44.99 you get it a little cheaper if you get the monthly subscription and uh as of right now unless my web designer turned it off i think you get an extra free month which we were doing for wppi which might be wrapping up there are codes from wppi for the flex kit and for uh my pro board which is also a board that i mean oh you got to see the h2 pro bags was that on the, the... This is the best thing I designed. I don't know why. you get, Does anybody ever go around with sandbags? Who's got sandbags? I was about to say, that is... I've just been on your website. That's the first thing I'm going to buy. So Nig- Nigel Perry just said he's going to buy one of those. Buy some H2 Indoors. Pro bags. Shebang. All right. So um, explain these. So we got... I got everything that I do was about me... What, what's happened in my business is I used to shoot all actors, and now everybody needs a headshot. So now I'm running around town. I'm running around the country. I've got to get on a plane. So the flex kit was designed to fly with. I, the one thing that I always hated taking were the sandbags. I mean, just getting them out of the studio was terrible. So now we developed a water-based solution that you fill up when you get there, and then you empty it. And, and yes, I try to empty it on plants, people, or something like that. Everybody asks me like that. Are you being environmentally conscious with that water? And yes, we are. We're trying to. Um, but hey, if you're traveling around and these roll up and I and I take I fit 18 of them in my bag coming back from WPPI, I was like, I need some in New York. Let's bring some back. Uh, piece of cake. They're just they're they're great. And I think it's the most amazing thing I've developed. Uh, well, the light kit's pretty amazing. The light is unbelievable. Right. So so you have your own line of products. You've got DVDs. You've mm-hmm. got books. The Pro Board, which is a, a flexible board that you use for... I needed to try. I didn't feel like bringing Seamless with me all the time. So I needed a background that was, that was fairly lightweight, rollable, and really clean and simple. And I, I use that. So it goes in a bag. And uh, this is the reflective one. I have a matte white, a glossy white. And I used to have a matte black, which is now... Uh, I'm working on getting it back. It's just tough to produce, and we've had been having some go arounds with that. But um, they've been they've been great, and you know, people. It's it's again, it's portability. Getting it, being able to do that. I used to uh, shoot to get uh, like a reflection under somebody's foot. I had to have this big, huge, chunky piece of plexiglass. Mm-hmm. You know, now I can go with my uh, glossy pro board and do it. If I'm doing product photography, I, I use it for that a lot. And my matte pro board, I love because. I use it as a backdrop on my on my headshot uh, sessions, and I can either strobe it to make it white, or I can let it go to a nice eighteen percent gray or whatever I want, any tone of gray I want, depending on how close my my lights are to the subject. And I usually I do the flex kit in the front, and I'll strobe the back. Let's see here. So the, the headshot crew 
Sorry, I want to get back to that. I want to talk. Okay, everything's so, on my gear page through Headshot Crew. Okay, too. so so um, Headshot Crew. Is, I really want to talk about this business again. You know, you make you make money through photography. There's kind of a limit to, to what you can do in terms of business through that. You can keep upping your price or whatever. There's only so many headshots or whatever. But you've been very smart in finding new streams of revenue, new avenues to pursue business in, uh, products, um, a uh, subscription-based website, um, DVDs. You do a lot of speaking. You're also a Canon Explorer of Light. Um, you know, what... How do you, first of all, you do so many things, I can't imagine how you keep your mind straight. I mean, it, it's like, you, you literally just came from Vegas, from WPPI, right? Yeah. Which is a crazy experience in general. You're live streaming the whole way through, right? You know, you're talking to your phone, your, your computer the whole way through. And then, you know, you, you come back here, you're right here in, you know, for a podcast and an event. You know, when do you, when do you break or do well, you the, break? The ADHD helps. <laughs> <laughs> the brain is all over the place you know and and um you know i've always been a little i've always been entrepreneurial i think the thing years ago i really hurt my business because i was so focused on trying to get other businesses i mean i love the fact that if somebody walks in my studio they get in front of my camera i press the button i get paid i think it's the best job in the world mm -hmm. i think it's amazing that i get to do that i just feel lucky that i actually picked up a camera in the first place but i was always like i live in the city i got a big studio i've got uh, uh, twins and you know trying to trying to make it here as a as a photographer you know isn't easy so i i always thought knew that i needed multiple sources of income beyond just having somebody in front of my in front of my camera when i'm shooting so i started to look outside of photography and it was a disaster it hurt my photography career um my my sessions went down i was focusing other things there was this story this this buddy of mine told me he said there was this this prospector it was like a diamond mine or something there was this prospector that uh went to prospect for diamonds in this diamond area in south africa and he bought this farm near it and every day he would go out and look for diamonds and uh, and one day he saw these people on his farm in the stream and they came over and they uh, they offered more than what the farm was worth to purchase it. And he's like, oh, yeah, take it away. Great. I'll go get something else and keep looking. Well, it turned out that he sold the biggest diamond farm in South Africa. Uh, so it, I, the story was called Acres of Diamonds. He had them under his feet. And what I was doing when I was shooting, I was building my portrait business, but then I was looking at other things. I had like friends, hey, I want you to do this business. I want you to do that business. And I started to go down those avenues and I, everything blew up, hurt my business. It hurt my photography. So I decided after hearing that story, I was like, okay, what's under my feet? I was like, what can I do to not only, and you know, who knew the teaching was gonna come? I didn't, I didn't know that. The F-stoppers really did that for me. They walked into my studio one day, took a, took a video of me and then the next thing I know more photographers were con as many photographers were contacting me as clients so I started to go down that path and then I started to add only things that were photo based this and then the cyphotology thing started I did a, a TEDx talk with a psychologist named Dr. Anna Rowley and we started a company called cyphotology where we mesh photography and and psychology which is kind of interesting um and you are looking at the headshot crews. I'm, I'm looking at the headshot crews now. Uh, so this is another thing you talked about teaching. You're, you're taking a, a bunch of headshot photographers on a cruise. <laughs> headshot crew, headshot <laughs> crews. Very yeah. funny. Nice. Well done. You like uh, that. <laughs> uh, so, so tell me about this. How, how do you make something like this work? You've got, you've got instructors, Dave Geffen's here. Um, yeah. explain, explain it. What's it going to be Dave's like? Here. It's amazing. I mean, the, the fact that I have the support of all these sponsors to help us do this, what we did was a, a year ago, the F-Stoppers always did the, they did for the past couple of years, they did a workshop in the Bahamas and they said they weren't going to do it this year and i and i was so a year ago i'm in the bahamas and I, i'm with one of my headshot crew members karen brown and we were talking and she's like why don't we take everybody on it why don't we do a cruise and i was like that's kind of cool the headshot crew cruise i was like let's let's do it let's figure out how to make this happen so we started uh getting our wheel spinning i really think the headshot crew the one thing that i love is that there's photographers there's ten thousand photographers on it all over the world but the thing that and i see them i do weekly crew casts i call them every week which are live and i see them through these live crew casts but it's really the one-on-one -on -one. when you meet somebody in person it's a different ball game 
it's so much different. So I was like, I want to meet everybody. I want to see who will come on this thing. So uh, we got it started. Canon came on as the main sponsor. Westcott sponsoring. Tether Tools is sponsoring. Um, and, you know, Hurley Pro is obviously sponsoring. Um, so it's been great getting those those people involved because this is what we're doing. You sign up for the cruise, which just went on sale. I can't even believe it. You sign up for the cruise and you get all this free teaching um, as part of it. So the speakers that are coming on are giving their time and the sponsors are covering their classes for all these people to come on and do it for free for the members of the cruise, which I think is great. The only paid classes are my signature classes, which I, which I teach, uh, which is illuminating the face and the headshot intensive. I just actually added headshot intensives all over the world, but the one on the cruise is going to be amazing. And the other thing that I did was it's about 1100 bucks to get on the boat. It's 1200 bucks to get into my studio to do a headshot with me. So I said to everybody who goes on this cruise, every photographer, now I'm not shooting, bring your kids, bring your family. I'm not shooting everybody. Do I have to shoot everybody? No. <laughs> but I'll give them a headshot. So basically their cruise is paid for. So I, I can't stand when photographers have bad profile pictures out <laughs> there or don't have a picture. How many of you guys don't have a picture of yourself on your website? Shame on you. I know you're out there. I don't know. I so need to fix that. What was it? The the um, the one where you your big viral video. Was it illuminating the face? The jawline and the squinch. Jawline. Oh, a squinch. S Q U I N C H. So what what propelled you sort of to internet fame? There it is. This one right here. Well, that's no. And no, that's the tutorial. Sorry. Sorry, everybody. Get f stoppers out of there, and then just put jawline. Jawline or squinch. Those are the two. Oh, There's there it the is. Squinch. Yeah, boom. Okay, so so you you did this video that uh, what is this? The first one was jawline. Looks like we That's got some got almost ads. Three million. Got all these ads, my man. Oh, Just skip, skip ads. Okay. Ad. God, you're monetizing everything, aren't we? Huh? But did I put that in? On I don't know. I um, probably so, did. I'm smart. Yeah, okay. So so you that? did. You ended up doing <laughs> this this this, uh, and you had shorter hair at this time. I did my hair. I don't know. I'm at a state. I don't know what my hair goals are. <laughs> anymore i don't know what to do with it should i go anyway okay, but so we'll so, talk so about my hair i, I want to talk about how you've gone from being relatively you know you do, doing your thing all of a sudden propelled to sort of stardom through the internet this this video has like two or three million views right the and well, then you can click, click on, on this one this one's the bigger one okay this one this one's even this better one's the bigger one 2.8 million views nice um and and what has that been like skip ad there we go this is the one that people stop me on the street about which is kind of strange. I went to Europe and, and I got stopped on the street in every city I went to. It was weird. I was like, this is crazy. You, you know the jawline video? Well, what's Jeez. interesting about it is it's not just for photographers, I think is, is the main thing. It's, it's, for, it's for anybody to learn how to look better in front of the camera and everyone wants that. I did it for photo I did it for photographers in the first place and then it went viral because people want to look better. Right. So, um, which is really interesting to me. I just uh, got to work with a client on a on a panel discussing this with a bunch of beauty editors which was amazing uh for me and i was with chloe kardashian and she instagrammed about go to her instagram get that up there you got to see this this is okay. unbelievable Cl this is just i don't from, normally go to chloe kardashian just to from go to her instagram yeah this is just this is the thing and, the, and these guys were talking about it before about the social media and what's happening and instagram is really it if you go down i'm Keep going. Where is it? Oh, you got to load more. There. Oh, this one right here. Well, no. That was, would be, oh, right here. Don't you see Sorry. Me? I see you. I see you. Stop I see you. Around. <laughs> nice. I bet that helped the Instagram feed a bit. I did. I mean, four. She's got forty-four million followers, and that's got three hundred forty thousand likes. So, um, it's just I'm getting. Were you more Were you uh, live streaming of, this? Is that what's I, going on? That's actually a video. This she amazed me because I I at WPPI and everything I have a lot of photographers coming up to me and I I try and I try and be nice to everybody but I kind of have CR what I call CRS can't remember squat <laughs> so I can't if I don't remember you it's not it's like horrible like it's just because my brain is so all over the place but um but she was with a hundred beauty editors and then. They wanted me to take a picture or, or do a selfie or do something with her because I was on this panel and I had to do it. And I asked her, my kids are big fans, and my wife, I said, hey, do you mind doing a little video to my wife and kids? And she's like, sure, let's go. And she did the cutest video after getting through the whole line of 100 people. Uh -huh. And uh, I was just, it really amazed me. 
you know, I was just blown away by her uh, energy and, and the fact that she stayed with it the entire time, which was, it's, it was really impressive. So uh, another thing about your headshot crew, uh, what you've been doing, so you've been building, is this not, no, where is it? Headshot crew, there we go. Um, nice. That's the cruise. But yeah. anyway, uh, you have been building content for your online subscription base. And at first you've been doing that by working with, with Dave building, yeah. you know, building that kind of work. And now you've really gotten into online streaming. Like uh, it, it, first it was Periscope. I don't know if you still do that now. I do. Facebook I live between the two. I... Well, so are you finding like how much success are you finding with it? Does it, does it get to be, is it, do you have this relationship with these people? Is it, is it like, do you feel like what <laughs> I just, I, uh... you know, it's, it's a weird thing for me. It's like, I want to find the right time to do a Facebook live or do a, a Periscope or something like that. But I think something interesting has to be going on, like for you to ca capture attention. So I try and do it when something's happening that's, hey, this this is something that's interesting. Let's do it. So uh, yesterday at Lee's wedding, I was just, I didn't even ask him if I could stream his wedding live, but I was shooting with one hand and had the can had my iPhone in the other uh, while I was while I was shooting and stream. I mean, I wasn't, I just figured I'd bring my camera for the heck right. of it. So and it, and everybody loved it. You know, it was it was just cool. Now, what it does for me, I don't I, I don't know. Following, um, obviously, a lot of my income comes from the educational side of things. So it's a lot of photographers. But I like the fact that I get to educate people on, on what their face is doing um, and how to behave in front of camera. I just can't stand photographers you know, saying smile to people or saying one, two, three, getting them ready for something. Like there's nothing to get ready for. Mm -hmm. What are they? They're, they're not going to get any better. If they did, we wouldn't all be here. We wouldn't, you know, we make them better. The photographer has to direct them into making them better. They don't know what their, nobody knows what their face looks like right now. Do you? You don't know. We have to be the ones to tell them what their face looks like and make sure, you know, we get something good at them. It's our job. And that was another thing that we talked about in the previous podcast. We'll link, link that in the YouTube description below but um we talk about how it's that's half oh it's right here cyphotology 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 yeah. is what you call it and yeah. um you know you you're really you really have to have an uh, uh um, not, not, it's a uh, rapport with your with your subject you have to be able to get that moment because i know if i, I know from experience photographing people i know i kind of clam up in front of a camera and everything if if you're having a bad day say you know you might have a hard time getting through to that person but every day you have to kind of be on and be happy and make them make them light up i think that is the the key and i like what nigel said earlier that he likes meeting him cold and stuff i mean i'm the same people ask me well don't you have to sit down with them? i'm like no i don't want any of that i actually don't want to talk about photography with them for me anyway until they're right in the mix like until they're in there uh once they're in front of my camera then i might talk about how i want them to, to behave but i don't i try not to even breach the subject before they step foot in there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh let's talk a little bit about the all these um expos i mean half the time like you're in vegas you're in the middle east you're you're talking at these different conferences and, and whatnot and you're doing this a lot, it has a lot to do with the fact that you're an explorer of light now, yeah? I mean, you do a, you have a lot of speaking gigs. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, Canon's, and has, being involved with Canon has been phenomenal. I'm just so psyched that they, I mean, they they, they said, hey, would you, you know, they offered me becoming an explorer of light. What an honor. I yeah. was like, amazing. And I get to uh, go to all these things and speak on their behalf and speak about the equipment that I'm using, which I love. Uh, it really changed my game. I was a, a medium format shooter, and when the 5DSR came out, I went straight for it, and I haven't put it down since. Really? I, yeah. So now you I mean, now you strictly are shooting with a five DSR. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. And it's because these files are just massive. They're massive. The stuff looks great. I love it. You know, it's fast. It's, Have you, you seen know. a difference? Because when you were you were using medium format before, and to, I'm not a medium format shooter, so forget, forgive me if I'm wrong. But you are usually looking down into those, right? No, I didn't have those. I had a Hasselblad for years, and then I went to Phase and. Uh, and I never had a, a waist level viewfinder, but but you look straight through them. But, gotcha. Um, you know, I mean, the thing, the biggest thing for me, the biggest difference that's been amazing is I travel a lot. Again, it's ha trying to condense your pack so that you can get on the road. And I really, legitimately, when I go on jobs, I bring a, a 5D Mark III as a backup, a five my 5D SR, and two lenses. I bring the 24 to 70 and the 70 to 200. Really? And I might throw an 85 1.2 in there. And that's it. That's what I go with. Gotcha. Um, 
Wow. I mean, that's easy. Easy peasy. That's it. Uh, and I use the F4 on the 70 to 200 because it's about half the size of the really 2.8. Light. It really it's is a nice. It's light. I love yeah. the lens. And yeah, I don't even have to worry about the size. It's amazing. So um, in your studio, that's another thing. You have a studio here. Do you mm -hmm. own or you rent your studio? I rent it. You rent it. Okay. Because yeah. that's, I mean, that's a, a big a nut, big nut, you know, uh, having a studio in New York. I mean, yeah. it's a, a lot, costs a lot of money. Um, when, when in your studio, do you typically work with assistants or do you, uh, I mean, for a headshot, for, for the most part, you probably have your setup and your lighting all ready to go. My stuff doesn't move. You know, the only, the only actually Dave and myself shoot out of there and then I have one assistant. So she's in there, but she mostly does scheduling. And if I need her to move the lights, she'll help me move the lights, but it's really rare. Yeah. You know? How much, how much of your time do you spend now, would you say, let's, let's say in the last couple of years, since you've been doing more speaking, building these products, publishing a book, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What, what percentage of your income would you say has gone from being fully uh, photographic to being more, you know what I mean? Like what's coming in from your, your headshot work now, not num numbers wise, but you know, percentage wise yeah. and uh, versus the other streams of revenue that you have and do you feel that that's an important part of you being able to survive and do what you do because you're diversifying so much yeah i mean it's been i've been very fortunate like i feel like the headshot genre is the biggest growing genre in portrait photography right now i mean the calls that i get every day are phenomenal like what people need and everybody needs a headshot now before it was just like i was shooting actors so it was New York and LA and I opened a studio in LA and I would go back and forth and and I I wouldn't know what to do if a CEO walked in front of my camera I wouldn't know what to tell him because I always had this my shtick was for actors and geared towards talking to actors um, and now it's gone from I would say you know it slowly started dwindling down where it went from 90% actors 10% like corporate or personal branding stuff to like 50 50 and now I would say it's 60 40 it's probably 60% more corporate and personal branding stuff and 40 percent actors um but in terms of uh my income change it was dramatic because the i was shooting all the time and i only had that one click the button get paid that was it mm -hmm. and i did really well you know um and then the recession hit and that went down a little bit maybe this was like 2008 2009 i didn't start teaching till 2010 2011 i think i did my first workshop and my education kind of flipped it, but then my my um, my shooting came back really strong, and mm -hmm. my rates went up. Mm -hmm. So now my rates are the highest they are. I don't have to shoot as much, but I I teach a lot. So my income's you know better than ever, and probably from the teaching, it's probably flipped. It went it went to like fifty fifty shooting, teaching. Maybe now it's like it's probably like sixty. 40 shooting to teaching something like that right i always felt like shooting was what fed my teaching um so i always want to keep the shooting up sure but the the jobs that i have coming in are are amazing it's just that i'm i'm also traveling so much to teach that it's hard to be in the studio to to shoot those jobs like in the month of february i was in i guess actually since let's say the 11th of march i think since 13th 13th of March. Okay, so since January 1st, I've been in New York maybe 10 days, I think. It's wow. been crazy. And how, I mean, is that difficult? Maybe on, two weeks. On your family? Like you got two kids and life? Like, yeah. Hard, is it like. Yeah, I was in WPPI and my daughter broke her toe. Aww. I was like, oh my gosh. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. The other one, she did, likes doing handstands, and the other one thought she'd be funny and put a chair behind her when she came down, and she came down all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so one, one of the things that we didn't talk about in this podcast, and again, go back to his first podcast with us to hear more about it, but you, you were a, a model. That's how you, you mean, before all this photography came up. So yeah. this sort of, Can't sort you of the, tell? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you're a, modeler, a model and a professional Olympic sailor for, for the Olympic sailing team, um, which you're getting back into. Yeah, I'm going next week. I'm going out to L.A. I'm doing some shooting, and I'm going to race. Oh, wow. Very yeah. cool. And um, so I, my question is, is, you know, when were you always a, a pretty good businessman? Like, did, like this... Like it seems good like point. right now you seem like you're a pretty good businessman. Did that all come at some point? Did someone you you know you have some business partner? What's how this all like? How this all? I have in? no idea. That's the one part of it that I can't put a finger on. I had uh, before. Let's see. Before I picked up a camera, I had uh, delivered beer in the summers. I was working on a beer truck, and then uh, I was a sailing instructor, and then uh, I graduated from college and I worked in a sail loft. 
And then the guy gave me a week off. I went to do a race. I won a national championship. I decided to train for the Olympics after that. So I just, I did, that was, those are the only jobs I had. And then I, uh, I had a designer from Donna Karen said, have you ever been photographed before? I was like, no, well, we got to get you sponsored. Shot me, um, found out that Polo was looking for real sailors for an ad campaign, sent my picture over. I show up on set and Bruce Weber is the first photographer to shoot me for a job. And uh, we became friends, and then he told me to pick up a camera. So I'm blaming it all on him. <laughs> Here's a, a quick, uh, a quick pick here on your about section of of, of that uh, modeling job that you did. Uh, very cool. Um, wow. I mean, that's great. So, uh, by the way, if anyone has any questions, feel free just to raise your hand, and we will pass you a mic. Um, what's What's next, man? I mean, like, are, are we just Grinding? Are we are are we doing anything uh, new? Do we have anything uh, big coming up? My next, the, my thing is really, and I and I kind of realized this from doing this um, this thing I did recently where I was talking about the human face, and and people want to look better in front of cameras. I've never had anybody walk in my studio and go, "Hey, I know you're really good. Can you take it down a notch today?" <laughs> you know, it's never happened. Everybody wants to look their best, so. I think my next thing is, I mean, the book, the headshot that I that I put out was really to teach photographers how to take headshots. I think the next thing is to really go after, you know, helping people figure out how to look their best. Because a lot of people, you know, I, I call it, you know, some people are f photogenic, obviously, in front of a camera. People have been known to be photogenic. I think the thing is, is that we walk around in public. We need to know what our face looks like. I coach um, executives and stuff on this through my Cyphotology program on how to behave when they're they're in a room let alone let alone you know in front of cameras what your face is saying to somebody is so important so i call it facial genics you know you need to know what your face is doing at all times so that you can convey that like for me it's very difficult to to be on this side of the room and look this way it feels weird because i would rather be where i should have switched seats with you i should be over here talking to, i feel more confident that's why i'm on this talking side. to people like this <laughs> than i do like this is that yeah see you're a lefty too <laughs> left side of your face so i and I, and you see that and when and i think the thing is is that when people walk into a photo session they're anxious no matter who they everybody changes i would model for like eight years you put me in front of a camera i change so I think our job as photographers is to change people back and bring themselves out of it. You know, that's that's huge. So teaching, I think doing a, I think my next book might be geared towards people and, and going on a speaker circuit. I've had uh, been asked to speak on this subject um, in a number, number of places. And it's amazing because it's so I did this. Uh, just to do a TEDx talk at MIT was just phenomenal to talk about this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I love that, and I think that's the move. We have a question from the audience. Uh, about the, uh, the teaching, if, uh, if you have a student who is showing you pictures that you find really uh, disappointing, shall we say, and maybe you're struggling uh, how, to, how to help them, and you want to give them tough love in a way, but you you want to balance honest with with supportive. How do you how do you find that supportive when the stuff is really, um, you know, shall we say uh, entry Subpar. level stuff? <laughs> well, the bar changes depending on the person's talent. Like I if I I get all ranges in the headshot crew and we do live crew casts every Tuesday and Thursday at four o'clock. So I'm on every Tuesday critiquing people. And uh, if I go in and go hammer time on them right off the bat, knowing what their level is, it's not really fair because maybe they haven't been there a very long time. I have certain things that I that that I teach that they should know. Like, I really loathe double chinsville. I don't think anybody should ever be in it. You know, if their shot is like this and the person's like this, that's not cool. So they obviously haven't seen my jawline videos, so I'm not going to hammer them on that right off the bat. But I will take the bar and raise it as they get better. And then I'll go hammer time when I have to. It is tough love, though. I mean, if they don't, they don't come in there and throw up a shot for critique, you know, uh, to not be, you know, told what I think about it or what the other members of the crew think about it. At some stage of the game, I think as an artist, you have to stop caring what other people think of your work, and it has to be internalized into what you think of your work. Like I don't, you like. I never put my work out there for critique. I put the shot that I believe I love, and whether people like it or not, that's up to them. That's that's where I'm at. Right, but the student is, but is a paying student, for your critique. Exactly, so I can't do it without that. But at a certain point, 
I want everybody to get good enough that they do not have to do that and they have the ball in their own court. So they can survive um, the hammer time if necessary. They should be able to survive. If you're putting it out there, you should be able to survive whatever whatever comes your way. But you have to look at the the people that are critiquing. Like if you go into a, a forum online and somebody goes hammer time on your work and then always look at their work and see who's talking to you. Like you shouldn't feel bad about something that somebody says if they're not. And, uh, you know, I mean, if you, don't I, if you have opinion. to respect people's opinions right. and be able to put it out there and then have thick skin to say, hey, OK, I'm learning. How did what did I learn from this and where can I? Where can I go with it? Now, you don't want to have like the American Idol syndrome where you just, you know, you've seen these singers who they, they sing and like everybody's like like this and they think they're like the cat's meow. You know, you don't want to have that about your pictures. You have to have like an eye, you know, I mean, or you have to develop an eye. And uh, I don't know where eyes come from. I mean, I don't know how I decided what I like when I see it, but I know what I like when I see it and I know... Right. You so know, if, if a student is brand new, but their stuff is really weak and in your gut, you would love to go hammer time. What what's the kind of thing you would say to avoid that that uh, unnecessary hammer time for well, that weak for, beginner? for me, for these beginners, we have wing a wingman program. So it's not me doing the hammering. It's it's another wing wingman. So the associates, they can get wing people. So mm -hmm. we have wingies and wingmen and wing women. And uh, once you're in the program for three months, you get set up with a wing person, and then you work together with that person to get your stuff up to snuff. We also have uh, pre-reviews, so they don't have to come to me first. If we feel, yeah, it doesn't really need to go all the way to, to Peter right now. Let's start here and get a... So it's, it's a very... Uh, the, the group is just so wonderful with everybody and so wonderfully supportive. And I go hammer time on people who aren't. I don't want them as part of my group. I've been known to find sus people out and say hey you either settle down or this is not the place for you thank you very much yeah. um well that was great um if there's any other questions we can take a short one but we we should be getting going because the store's closing and oh we got to do our raffles the store's, closing. the store's closing it's an early early close day you know how, how it is on sundays right. but um you know peter i i really appreciate you coming back and and helping us helping us promote and and just being part of our our 100th podcast it's uh, really been a pleasure having you on the first time getting to know you more over the last many months it's been almost a year almost since it's i it's been awesome it's been a while it's been awesome um so uh thank you again adorama canon professional services temba bags and of course peter hurley thank, thank you, you for having me on. we'll see you again next time everyone subscribe to our youtube page